All right, here we go now. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this is our Economic Action Team live webinar. And we have a very special guest with us. Um, we have Dylan Jones. And we'll get to know him in a little bit. So, My speakers. Oh, gosh. Um, Dylan, how are you today? I think the speaker's cut out just now. So, hey, everybody. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. And this is our economic action team live webinar. And we have a very special guest with us. We have Dylan Jones. And we'll get to know him in a little bit. Um, but first of all, I would like to welcome everybody who's here and thank you for joining. Especially thanks to Dylan for being very kind um, and taking time out for us and for you guys. So Dylan, how are you today? Ah, doing good, doing good. All right. So I'm going to um, probably uh, start uh, start the session right now, right away, because Wayne is not going to be on, so it's unfortunate for us. But anyhow, um, I'll probably get started now. So Dylan, uh, just start um, by telling us about a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're doing and uh, what you like to do, what your passions are. And yeah, let's get started. Yeah, sure thing. So yeah, my name is uh, Dylan Jones. I'm a biologist and science communicator. So right now I'm currently in the Masters of Evolutionary Biology program at San Diego State University. And um, my current research is like this big data biogeography trying to figure out where species are and why they are where they are. Um, and I'm doing that with the, uh, with the reptiles and amphibians of middle America, so like Mexico to Panama. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of different stuff. I am really, really into communication, uh, communicating science and education. Um, so that's something that's wrapped up in this presentation as well. But um, yeah, we'll get to that when we get to the presentation. All right. So if you wouldn't mind, um, tell us someone who had a big influence on you other than your parents or uh, yeah, other than your parents, even maybe in your childhood or, you know, as you were growing up? Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question because I, I sort of took inspiration from a lot of different people. Um, I, I used to be really, really terrified of nature and wildlife in general, and now I'm someone that goes out often. So what, what really inspired me a lot was um, Steve Irwin was someone that I, I watched almost religiously growing up. Um, any moment I could, I would turn him on the TV and you know, watch The Crocodile Hunter. Uh, but as I sort of grew and developed into uh, research and science, I, I started to gain a whole bunch of other influences. Um, a big one was Dr. Duncan McKenzie during my undergrad, who just really pushed me to do research and be involved in the research process. Um, and there's, I mean, there's so many mentors along the way that offer little bits of advice or little bits of inspiration that... I take and you know make into who I am today. Awesome. So tell us a um, little bit, little bit about um, your school. Like uh, you, you're a master's student, right? Or are you uh, finished mm -hmm. with, with your courses? Yeah, right. Right now it's a master's student. I um, so I had a lot of ecology backed <laughs> experience. So going out in the field and finding out where species are and what. what what are they doing in an area? But I really became fascinated with evolutionary theory in the like last year of my undergraduate degree. So I, I ought to do a master's in evolutionary biology to really learn that theory so that I can apply it to a PhD afterwards. Awesome. Okay, so um, can you tell us what uh, really, really um, intrigued you in this course? Yeah, so I guess I always describe myself as a storyteller first and a biologist second. And they, they may seem like different things, but they're really not. Because whenever I look at 
biological concepts, when I look into theory, when I, when I look at species and where they are and how they got there, I see a story. So the, the thing that got me into this like, evolutionary field more is that it's telling these stories that span millions of years. While, while ecology, I always say like ecology is like a beautiful painting. It's, it's a snapshot of a certain moment, but evolution is the story behind the painting. It's, it's why does the painting look the way it does? So I just became really fascinated with that and sort of did a deep dive into uh, this, this like subfield of biology. And I, I don't know, I've, I've just been in love with it ever since. Cool. All right. Uh, can you tell us uh, something about the scientific method that we hear about, like when a scientist goes out and studies, um, sorry, I got cut out a little bit. So can you tell us about <laughs> this, uh, um, the scientific method you use when you, you are um, studying or observing, let's say, the nature? Yeah, so so mine is a very it's a very interesting way of working with it. So I'm I'm not I'm not actually going out into the field. I specifically chose a project that did not have field work, so that I could really learn how to work with these uh, massive data sets. So I use information from public access databases, basically just things that anyone can access and manipulate. But I'm working with up to a million records of where species are found. I work with massive data sets that encompass like how 2,000 species are all related to one another. And I use all that data in concert with one another to sort of just figure out what is going on in middle America. Why are there some regions that have super high diversity while other regions don't have diversity? So I'm, I'm really diving into, yeah, big data processes to figure out, well, why are species the way they are? Why are they in the area they're at? Um, so it's, it's a very interesting way of doing biology because you're not necessarily um, going onto the ground and identifying single species at a time, but what you're able to do is get this massive picture and it really enables us to tell stories that last, you know, that, that span millions of years instead of maybe, uh, you know, a couple decades. Uh, it's a very interesting way of doing biology and I'm very excited to be learning how to do it much better than I ever have. I suppose um, your data contains um, information ab about um, uh, all different kinds of things, species. Um, there are also um, in, in other, other areas other than the United States, or is it just um, based, in, based in, in the United States only? So it's, it's interesting. So all, all of my field work um, prior to this project that I did do was based in Central America. I spent a lot of time in Belize and um, some time in Costa Rica and uh, Panama. So that, that's what I'm focusing on is, is this area from the American Southwest down into the, the upper reaches of South America. And I'm using all of the species that are contained there. So it's about it, it's about 2100 species, depending on where you draw boundaries and uh, what, what databases you're looking at. Wow, awesome. Um, so I would like to ask you some, uh, some more personal questions. Um, mm -hmm. What do you do in your free time, if you wouldn't mind telling us? And the next question is, is there a book that you're reading um, that is not related to your course or you know, just for fun? that you'd like to recommend to our audience? Yeah, um, so in in my free time, whenever I find some, I'm actually really into music. Um, I play, I've been playing guitar for, I don't know, I think eight years now, and it's just been one of my favorite side hobbies. I also just really like photography, um, which, which goes into a lot of this science communication stuff that I do. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's a lot of just artistic and creative hobbies, I guess, if I really boil it down. But uh, in terms of books, so I, I actually, I, I love science fiction and that's something that I think has always influenced how I see nature and how I view things and whatnot. So right now I'm rereading uh, one of my favorite books. It's called The Wind Up Girl. Um, I think it's by Paolo, I always, I always mispronounce his last name. It's uh, Baka Palugi, I think. I'm probably mispronouncing that. But it's a fantastic eco-fiction book about what happens when we're in a world that uh, has essentially massive crop destruction 
and we have a society where we can actually sort of create uh, human beings uh, from like a like lab based human beings. And it's just a really fantastic book that makes you think about a lot of issues that we're actually dealing with today. Wow, that sounds like fun. All right. So let's uh, transition into your presentation. So take it away. Yeah, sure thing. So the uh, yeah, so the presentation that you y'all have all seen the, uh, the the starting slide now for a bit is about science communication, and it's really talking about what it is and how it can be used for change. Uh, before we go into it, I always like to give a little bit more of an introduction about who I am. So yep, my name is Dylan Jones. I'm a biologist and science communicator. I go underneath the handle Dylan the biologist because I, well, my name is Dylan. I'm a biologist. But I do science communication, which we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a lot of different ways. Primarily, I work through Instagram. And I, I like Instagram because of the amount of creative freedom you can have, because you can do videos, you can do pictures, you can do graphic design posts, um, or like micro blogs, which are just shorter blogs. But this is really where I do a lot of my content. And it ranges about talking about things about me being in grad school and like, how does that work to me asking questions such as, like there's one or two on the screen, like how can we include communities in conservation or just talking about cool science, like what is thermoregulation? Um, I, I keep it kind of broad, but all underneath the umbrella of what it means to be a biologist. But I also do some videos and live streams. I really like to break down scientific papers into stories. I like to actually read the paper and say, well, how does this convey to me? How do I read it as someone who's first in science? And I, I really like to do live streams where I just either go out on a hike or I break down some concept or just look into things further. So I, I kind of do a full gamut of content creation. And, and that's me. But what is this presentation actually going to cover? Well, first, it's going to cover how is science actually communicated? So this sort of what is science communication? And then how can social media specifically promote conservation, sustainability, and science literacy? then I really like to focus on what actually makes an effective science communicator um, or what makes effective science communication. So it's just saying, what is it? Because anyone can communicate science. I, I'm a firm believer of that, but how can we make it effective? And then I always encourage people to do this, always encourage people to do science communication. So I just want to give some tips about how can you actually just start doing some science communication. So let's start. And I'm going to use a much broader term uh, than science communication. So research communication is something that it, it's an umbrella term that encompasses many things. And it's specifically the process of interpreting or translating complex research findings into some context that non-experts can understand. Now, science communication is what I do. So I'm um, translating these complex science research into something more understandable, but this can be applied to many different things. I know people who are liter uh, literature uh, research communicators or that are performing arts research communication. So it's, it's a very broad term, but I, I want to focus on some notable research communicators because there's actually a lot of variation in how this is accomplished. Uh, probably a big one that is a household name is Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, astrophysicist, planetary scientist, science communicator. He's really fantastic at breaking down these concepts about space and making it digestible for really anyone. Then there's uh, Greta Thunberg, who's more on the activism side. She's an environmental activist, but she is really fantastic at communicating the research that climate scientists have done. And I, I always like to throw her in here because you don't have to be the author of a science communication piece to do science communication. It's about distilling other research into something that is digestible for anyone. And then there's Miss Frizzle, who is the science teacher and the magic school bus driver. Uh, brilliant science communicator. I, I guess you could really say it's the writers and the animators that made this great science communication, but it's, it's showing that it doesn't have to be just social media or being a person speaking to large audiences. You can communicate science in so many different ways. Um, and that's what I really like to show because it is a diverse field. But how is research typically communicated, right? So you, you're a scientist, you go out, you, you find some data, you write it up, and then you publish your research. Uh, well, that is communicated through TV and movies, uh, often documentaries. Uh, you know, any, any David Attenborough documentary is communicating research. It's communicating science about wildlife. 
There's also outreach and education, which is just going out to a to a uh, like a library or a school or out to an event and just teaching. Uh, I do a lot of outreach and education. I used to do a lot more than I currently do, but that is such a fantastic way to communicate things because it's very hands-on. You're talking to people one-to-one. -one. There's also presentations, just like we're doing here. Uh, it can also be presentations of your research, what you've done. Every grad student has to give presentations at some point, and that's an often a very common way that research is communicated. And there's journal articles. This can be your, you know, paywalled uh, academic journal, or this could be popular science. This can be something that is a, a blogger is writing about it. So that, that's another way that research is communicated through these blogs and articles. But there is one other one that I use very heavily, and that is social media. Now, social media is a pretty broad term. It comes to many things. I put some common ones, you know, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, all of those are social media. But I really like research communication through social media because anyone can communicate it. There is no barrier to entry other than being able to make an account. And because of that, you can be extraordinarily niche. I have a friend who he uh, his, his entire account is based on showing people Tasmanian tigers. He goes out and he finds uh, uh, old pictures, old journal articles, and he just communicates research on Tasmanian tigers. It's, it's so niche and connections happen very easily. That's, that's what I really like about having a social network to communicate on. Because these connections happen easily, not only do you just find new places to network, new people to meet, but you can actually really dig down and start to work with people to make better research communication. And so this is, again, just a very brief intro into what research communication is. And yes, we can look at definitions. I can tell you this is how it's done. But I actually want to give you some case studies because the goal of research communication at, at any level is to actually make a change, whether it's just changing someone's opinion about something or uh, raising awareness for a topic or just wanting to change how they see the world. So I have three different little case studies about stuff that I am either currently doing, have done, or that I have always done uh, to sort of showcase how we can actually make effective change. And the first one is this iNaturalist competition. Now, this is a weird one because it's actually still in progress. We're about halfway through it. And this is a such an awesome way to create effective change. Now, for those unaware, iNaturalist is a mobile website and app that allows you to record species observations. You just take a picture with your phone, upload it, and you can see, hey, this is this species. It was found at this location at this time and day. And it is very popular around the world. There's over, um, I guess right now, it's over 69 million observations. It is a very awesome, awesome tool. But I'm making, I made a competition for this. Uh, I, that uses this iNaturalist app. And basically, through, the, uh, through iNaturalist, I am encouraging people, it's called biodiversity in your city. I have people filling out forms that say, hey, I want you to go into your city and find as much biodiversity as possible. Right now, we're getting people from about, I think it's four continents, um, but it is so fantastic. There are several rules. There's a point system because I actually want to rank people. You get five points for every new species you find, one point if you duplicate species up to 10. But this competition runs through the entire month of June. And we're only two weeks into this competition, really. And so far, we've already seen 4,000 observations encompassing about 1,600 species. I think that might actually be 1,700 now. Um, I checked it right before this. And what we've really what we really have are a lot of people going out and making observations. Now, the cool thing about iNaturalist is that these observations are actually used in research. So a lot of these observations I can actually use in my own current project. Um, because the community validates what the species is, it can be used by really anyone around the world to study, say, when flowers are pollinated. It can be used to study where species are found be used to study how birds are migrating through a certain continent. So what this is, what this project is really doing is it is encouraging people to get out there to record observations and contribute to science in a really fun way. 
But, um, and this is something I'm gonna do for each of these case studies, is I'm going to talk about what is actually making this work. And what's making it work is that I have that split point structure. I, I mentioned this early on, where it's five points for new species. That is really encouraging people to get out there and find new species, right? If someone has really into reptiles and amphibians, because there's this new point structure, it's going to encourage them to go out and look at plants or look at insects or look at birds. I'm um, just essentially getting out there and finding something that's new. I also have weekly rewards and challenges. Um, this past week, we did one where all plants that are found give you three bonus points. And we did that to match up with a, uh, we were running an invasive species week where people posted about invasive species in their area and plants are often some of the most common invasive species. So we sort of tied in some community elements into this competition. But I think the biggest thing that really makes it work is that I'm fostering competition. Some of that is just posting these contest updates, right? Saying that, hey, you guys are doing awesome. I really want to see what you can find. While other times it's saying that, hey, uh, Adam has now taken the lead in the competition. And probably the funniest part of this competition that is going on right now is that uh, just a few days ago, my mother actually joined. And she has been observing way more than anyone has expected. So I've actually been teasing people in my Instagram story, you know, like saying like, hey, Natasha, hey, hey, Lark, my mother is beating you in the competition. And this has actually been really fantastic. And it's really encouraged people to get out there because there, there's something about like beating the organizer's mother in a competition that makes people want to get out there. But all of these together really work to get people out there and start finding species. Now, I'm going to transition into talking about a case study about that broadly encompasses science literacy and social activism. Now, science literacy is the knowledge and understanding of scientific concepts that is required for making personal decision making, participating in cultural and civic affairs, and just economic productivity. In essence, how can we distill science and do something with it? How can we understand it so that we can actually use it to make effective change? And I lump it together with social activism because in many cases, um, activism about a particular cause, whether it be a, like, climate change, whether it be um, about just like, a, like equity or whatever, can benefit from using science literacy. And I think what the best way to show this off is actually what I've been doing for this month. So this month is a pride month. It is all about a, you know, bringing awareness, bringing, uh, celebrating LGBTQIA plus folks. So what I've been doing is on Fridays, I have been doing posts that are roughly centered around um, science that has involved um, sexual preferences, identities, et cetera, et cetera. And so I have these three posts on here. And like, I, yes, I did a post about, are these lizards lesbian? There are these New Mexico whiptails that people call lesbian lizards. And I, I talked about it. I had a post about are chemicals in the water turning frogs gay, which is a, a you know, a meme from, I think it's Alex Jones said it and people just sort of took it. But I talked about that, like what is actually going on there? And then sort of a, uh, sort of a preview, this is a post, the last one on the right is what I'm doing on this Friday. And it's a post about uh, this frog doesn't care about your sex system. It's about this frog that has these really diverse and unique ways of determining its sex. Even within the same population, it can change. But the thing is, all of these were actually vehicles for larger social issues. Even though I'm breaking down scientific articles, I'll be talking about chromosomes or behavior or uh, chemical pollution. These are all vehicles for social issues. For example, the first one is actually really to talk about that there are these massive variations in sexual systems in nature. Um, it's, it's not a binary, uh, you know, boy likes girl, girl likes boy type of system. There are, these lizards do engage in sexual activities with same sex. There are some that don't engage in any sexual activity whatsoever. They are entirely female and they can reproduce asexually. So I use that to talk about it. I, I entered in the system with a scientific article with something that is known, and I use that to talk about a broader social issue. The second one is actually about water pollution and how, um, in this case, it was uh, talking about the chemical atrazine, which is a very common uh, herbicide that is actually banned in many areas around the world except in the US. 
and the the corporation that produces it um, slandered the scientist who found that these that this chemical was turning frogs, turning male frogs into females, making them hermaphrodites, and um, really destroying their sexual systems. And this last one, which again hasn't posted yet, is really to talk about that there's a lot of fluidity in sex determination systems, and that chromosomes are not always perfect, which ties in very well to humans that have um, very uh, like chromosome differences at birth, right? It's it's never it's not this perfect thing where there's a normal and an abnormal. It's there's just variation. So what tips can I bring for this and like using these posts to, you know, breed science literacy as well as talk about social issues? Well, I, I see them as a vehicle to talk about issues. That's something I've really said quite often uh, is that you can use these breakdowns of scientific articles to talk about some larger issue. But I also say follow trends and what is sort of on the public focus. So. Following trends can be something as simple as Instagram is really using reels to compete with TikTok. So I do a lot of reels. Um, I, I listen to what the public is talking about, right? Like I, I turned the meme of our chemicals in the water turning frogs gay into a science communication piece. And I also listen to what my own followers are looking for. They have questions that I keep seeing pop up. So I'm going to talk about it. So that that's really awesome. Like that's a really great way because it's bringing people, you're, you're bringing your own knowledge into what the public is being aware about. But also, I say design things to be shared. That is, I think, the most effective thing you can do if you are trying to communicate research. You want it to be shared to people. And this can mean shareability as like just literally saying, share this post. That works surprisingly well. Just saying, share it, people will share it but it's also making it visually attractive. It's making it to where someone will say, they wanna take a single screenshot and say, send it to their friend saying, hey, this is really cool, I think you'd like this. So I, I am very intentional about designing slides that people will want to share them. And that's what I say about science literacy and social activism. Now I have one more case study and it's a really awesome one. I, I loved being a part of this. This was the Mammals Community Spotlight that we did back in April. Now, this was an awesome, awesome event that was meant to raise money for a conservation organization. Now, Mammals is a live streaming platform specifically catered towards nature. I've partnered with them and I've worked with them for about, I think about a year now. They're currently just now getting out of beta testing. But back in April, they held a 10 hour live stream event where they invited a whole slew of different content creators to present on something that they find interesting. And during this stream, uh, viewers could donate to Cool Earth, which is an awesome organization that works with rainforest communities around the world to halt deforestation. It really uh, incorporates local people into conservation. Now, my specific role in this was twofold. I was on a storytelling and conservation panel with a few other guests just talking about how can we tell stories to aid in conservation. And then later on, I told that story. I told one of my favorite evolutionary stories about Boletoglossus salamanders. They're this super, super cool genus of salamanders that have these interesting webbed feet. They can, uh, they can climb up vines, trees, leaves, or whatever. And it's a really interesting evolutionary story. And I did this story in specific because we were talking about rainforest conservation and why we need to preserve this species. So I tied it in together during this massive live stream event. And what was awesome is that we ended up raising $1,150 to specifically support food sovereignty and sustainable farming for Cool Earth's uh, project in Peru. So it was a, this is a really awesome example of how content creation science communication can actually cause change, can actually raise money for beneficial organizations. And what really made it work is that we had different creators. We gave them the freedom to do whatever they wanted. They just said, hey, you can do whatever you want. So I said, I'm gonna tell a story. They said, that's awesome. We had, um, we had Tanner Saul who came on and he gave a really awesome lesson about how to identify mammals from their skulls. We had um, Oliver Starr come in and talk about his wolves. He raises um, wolves that were in captivity when they shouldn't have been and he gives them like a, a new life. And he talked about how to do that, like how he does that and showed us the wolves live on stream. 
And because of these so many different creators, it attracted so many different audiences together. And because they gave them the freedom to do whatever they wanted, they could really create this awesome engaging content that made 10 hours go by in the blink of an eye. And this was all hosted in a central location. By collecting them all together, they can actually have a coordinated effort to raise money for this organization. And it was very successful. It was such a fantastic stream. I know there's another one they're gonna do, another spotlight in July that I'm sure they'll have announcements on. I don't really think about it at this point. But from here, I want to transition into some more uh, practical points, right? Like, well, what is a good research communicator? Because anyone can show what they know. Anyone can make a post. Uh, and I firmly believe that anyone can make a post talking about some scientific concept, something they find cool, but it's what makes it good, right? What makes it effective? And the first thing I always say is that they're knowledgeable. Now, this does not mean all knowing. For the vast, vast, vast majority of what I post, I do research beforehand. I don't just automatically know all this information. Knowledgeable in, in this context really means that you know enough to learn more. And so that's what I mean by knowledgeable. It's I know a good amount about biology, I talk about biology, and I learn more about it to become a, an effective communicator. The second tip is to be clear and concise. Now, this is, a, this is always sometimes abbreviated into dumbed down. I don't like that. Um, I personally think that dumbing it down is a disservice to the information you're providing, as well as saying that this person needs to have it dumbed down for them to make it understandable. That's not true. It just needs to be clear and concise. And that can be by refining the information, making it more digestible and um, shortening it, essentially. Also, visualizing concepts. I think that visual tools are so important for making things clear and concise. A picture really does tell a thousand words. And then I always say use jargon wisely. I'm not a believer that you should never use jargon or like really technical scientific concepts. I just think you need to use them maybe less. And when you do use them, define them. In many cases, using that jargon actually makes it clearer. However, you need to define it ahead of time. Like for me, I can say like my specific project, I can say it's uh, inferring regions of shared evolutionary history, um, which is a lot of words, or I can say that it's phylogenetic regionalization and then define it once or twice and just use that term again and again. So that, that's why I say use jargon wisely. Now the third one, I, I, think that, I think that everyone feels this third one a lot. It's being enthusiastic. Enthusiasm is, it's sometimes hard to convey it. However, if you're communicating something that you are really interested in, often that enthusiasm just comes across uh, implicitly. It, it just exudes from yourself. Now, of course, sometimes you, you can be the most passionate individual in the world, but actually conveying that enthusiasm can be difficult. So it is a learned skill. But what I say is, is I, I put this on here because I think it's worthwhile to think about how can I come across as more enthusiastic? And that's really important. Now, this next one is a little bit different. It's being consistent. This does not mean often. That is the most common misconception with consistency. Consistency means that if you're posting a really long piece once a month, you're posting it once a month. If you're posting little things once a day, you're posting once a day. But it just means that, hey, if you have followers, if you have people that are watching you and wanting to know more from you, they don't wonder where you are at. They don't feel like you're, um, you're just missing. They are waiting for your next post because you're consistent. They know it's going to come. And this differs greatly on the person. Currently, I post about five to six times a week on Instagram or other platforms. However, I used to post once a week and that worked better for my schedule at the time. And it didn't really change what I did that often. I just worked more on posts. So just define what works well for you and be consistent with it. And the last thing is just be authentic. Um, being authentic doesn't mean that you have to be like super, super, uh, everything is laid bare on the table. It just means that you're being a real person. And I think that while there are many people who are, you know, very fake on social media and they get big, what really makes science communication connect is when you're being authentic. And I think with science communication in particular, 
authenticity is so key because no one wants to feel like they're being talked down to by someone who is uh, putting on a mask. And it's also just showing that you are more than your work. You are more than your research. You are more than what you portray yourself as. Um, this is really common in biology. You know, just uh, a lot of us say, we're just biologists, that's all we are. And it's like, no, I, I post videos of me playing guitar. I, I post videos of me on heights. I, I show myself a lot more in my posts and that makes my science communication better. Now, um, there aren't examples, actually. Uh, <laughs> I needed to remove that. But this is just a clear overview of what makes good communicators. Uh, the examples, I guess, would be the posts that I had earlier showing that I'm trying to be knowledgeable, concise, enthusiastic, consistent, and authentic. And I always want to say these are learned skills. Every single one of them is learned. I was none of these when I first started out. Um, I, I really had to learn all of these at different times. Being clear and concise is still something I struggle with. Um, being authentic is something that I really pushed starting in January. It's something that was tough for me to be, you know, this real person online. It's tough. But I, I say that it's learned because that means that anyone can do it. It just takes the effort to learn it. Now, this is where I like to transition. This is nearing the end of the presentation. And I just want to say, how can you get started? I am always going to encourage people to actually get started in uh, research and science communication. And I have just five quick tips for how can you get started. And the first one is choose something that you enjoy creating. I like doing photography. I like making videos. I like graphic design. I like writing. Um, but when I started out, I only did photography because that's what I was really, really into at the time. And because I'm doing something that I enjoy doing, it makes it feel less of a, less like a job. It's something that I want to go out and do. And that sort of leads into the second one where it's communicate what interests you. I'm really into biology and evolutionary theory. That's what I communicate. I know other people who are really into chemistry and that's what they communicate. Others that are really into what is it meaning to be a graduate student and they communicate that. So by doing something that interests you, not necessarily what is um, the, the, the topic of the day, you're going to be enthusiastic and you're going to put more effort into it. So just find something that interests you and communicate. Again, let it be as niche and specific as possible. It doesn't matter what it is because people will find what you find interesting just implicitly. The third one is I always say connect with your community. This one is always an interesting one because you think that oh, I'm a content creator, I should just be creating content. Your community is who is going to be viewing that content. They're the people who are going to be consuming it. And by connecting with that community, not only will you have one more successful science communication posts or whatever, but you're going to find that you're going to enjoy it a lot more. And now what I found is that by connecting with my community very hard, I am very big on this. I'm always talking with people. I'm sending messages, um, commenting on their posts, consuming their content. What I found is that by connecting with them, it allows me to collaborate with them often. So we just started up this massive Discord server. We're at it about 140 people. Um, and all of us are science communicators and scientists and um, people who are just interested in science. Through there, we are able to collaborate on things pretty heavily. This competition that I'm currently running through iNaturalist, it is really done through that Discord server where I can post updates. We also had a awesome, awesome uh, community member who said, hey, let's do a post about invasive species all week long. And we sent her some videos. She made like a, like, a, like a TikTok of all of us together. And it allows us to collaborate. And by collaborating, you find that it's just fun. It's, a, it, it's, like, it's like a team project from school, but you actually want to be on the team. So it, it's very fun, and you just get a lot out of it. And then the last one is just to create, create, create. Um, stop trying to make it perfect. Don't, don't worry if it's, it doesn't need to be perfect at all. Just, just create something and get it out there. Um, I find that when I let my own perfectionism override the creative process, it sort of, everything falls down. And, but when I just power through and said, I just want to get this done and I want to get it out there so that people can consume it, it always does better than I thought. And it allows me to work on the next project without getting burnt out on the current one. So if you're just starting out, just create stuff and just put it out there. Don't worry so much about how your profile grid looks. Don't worry about, am I posting at the optimal time and the optimal number of posts a week? Just create. 
Um, and with that, thank you. Uh, and I will absolutely take questions, uh, talk about anything at this point. Awesome. All right. So audience, uh, this is your time. So type in your questions. And if not, I will ask my questions. So um, while the audience is thinking about it, Dylan, would you mind uh, showing us your Instagram page? Because I know that you, you uh, post pictures, you like taking pictures. So, yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> actually have it up. Yeah, I do have it up. Awesome. I All think right. you should be able to see this, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so this is my Instagram page. It's a yeah, large collection of posts or pictures. Um, this was my invasive species week post. These are all invasive plants. Like the whole hill side is one invasive species. Um, but yeah, we do. I do a lot of different stuff on this uh, Instagram page. All right. Right. All right. So uh, do you post on any anything else other than Instagram? Like I've seen um, YouTube icon somewhere in your presentation. So I suppose you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. But, uh, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. YouTube, yeah. <laughs> and what about Facebook? I'm just curious why you, you choose to post on Instagram um, rather than any anything else, like the Facebook. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting because I used to do Facebook a little bit, right? Um, right. I also used to do a lot more blogging. And I the, the thing with Facebook that got me away from it is that it's, it's kind of hard to really grow on Facebook. Um, like, I was really struggling with it. Right. And I think it's just the layout. It's, you know, it, it's, it's just a different platform. And I, I still have the page. I just don't do anything on it. And I really liked Instagram. I, I gravitated towards it because there's such a variety of things you can post. Um, you can post these, like, uh, like for example, the, yeah, the lizard's lesbian thing, you could post a carousel. So mm -hmm. a whole bunch of different, it's almost like a slideshow. Mm -hmm. um, or I could post a video, I can post pictures, I can post audio. There, there's just so much you can do on there. And I was able to really kind of figure out how to grow on here and find a really awesome community. Mm -hmm. um, I do also do YouTube for longer form content. I just, I don't like watching stuff on my phone, so I like YouTube. And I do post on that Mammals, um, or I, do, I guess I do live streams on that Mammals app, but currently they're in a beta phase. So the website is closed for uh, maintenance for uh, a couple months while they're getting out of that. And and how would people find you on Instagram? And uh, and if someone wants to grow um, more audience, how would they do that? Yeah, so um, you can find me on any platform um, that I've mentioned at, at Dylan the Biologist. Um, and, and growing on a platform is very interesting. It's it's partially looking into different techniques that work. Um, and, it, and it changes all the time. It used to be that hashtags were king on Instagram. If you were using hashtags, you could grow like crazy. And that's what I was doing for a long time. I was growing through hashtags and photography and it changed and it just didn't work for me anymore. And I've kind of been struggling to figure out what actually works. And so what, what I changed is specifically trying to make posts that people want to share to other people and really focusing on these carousels and reels. But the best way to grow, especially starting out, is to connect with people. Um, I spend about an hour in my mornings every day. I usually just um, turn on a podcast and sip on my coffee. And I go through Instagram and I comment on people's posts. I go to, um, say, a specific hashtag like, like biologists of Instagram. And I go through and I find people. I'm like, hey, this is a really cool post. I really like it there. Um, essentially just connecting with people. and you know, sending DMs, reading stories, stuff like that. That is honestly one of the best ways to grow because people want to be your friend. And yeah, I've made a lot of really great friends through here and they share your posts. They're more likely to engage with what you produce. So really just being part of the community is one of the best ways to grow. And then whenever you're making your posts, actually think about how will this post be shared? Will people want to share it? Does the post look good? Um, so there's a lot of like micro strategies you can get into, but ultimately it's connecting with people and making good content. Right, right. So good content and following people. So you, you talked about being consistent. Um, mm -hmm. So is there a, a specific 
day of the week or, or time that you follow um, or it doesn't matter just you know intervals yeah like that. so it's so if, if you look at my feed and I, I curate this feed a little bit I actually remove reels after they've been there for about two days so that they go into the to the reels tab because I have so much more here um, but what, what I do is that I, I try to post something every day at the bare minimum a story but I, I any post that is like here on my grid um, I make sure that they're posted right before my audience is at their max peak. So if you go on Instagram, you can view your insights. Uh, if you're a creator account or a business account, and I recommend doing that for sure. And mine tells me that my followers peak at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So that means that I post my stuff at around uh, 7.30 or 8 a.m. That way people see it, they're starting to get on the platform, and by the time most of my followers are on there, the post will have been liked by a bunch of people so that they can, it'll show up on their feed and whatnot. Um, but a lot of this is planning. So posts like these carousels that I have here, those I spend most of the week going through. Then I have reels, like I posted um, just a short video today. That takes me maybe 15 minutes. Um, or these some of these longer posts, like I think this one, like this post was just an introduction to me where I just put in a bunch of my pictures, um, just sort of showing who I am and what I've done. And so this post maybe took me 20 minutes. Um, and it's just me sitting down and saying, hey, I want to talk about who I am, what I'm doing right now, what's going on. And this is really awesome. But what, what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm varying my posts so that I can do something that takes me 15 seconds. I can do something that takes me all week, and I can have something that takes me maybe 20 minutes of my day. And that has allowed me to be consistent and flexible. I, I don't really have a schedule other than these carousel posts that I try to post every Friday. Um, so that gives me a goal to work towards, but it allows me a lot of flexibility through the week. Some of these I finish on a Monday and just wait for it to post. Awesome. So our audience has been very quiet. I see a, a comment uh, from Faye Christie. Uh, she says, I'm in a stage where I no longer trust um, surface. So she says uh, she's into quantum physics. Okay, cool. Yeah, sometimes cool. <laughs> things are not what they seem to be. Okay, that's a very uh, interesting thing. She has another comment with the above in mind. I like to watch Dr. Lawrence Doily, uh, C E T I Institute. Any thoughts on that? Oh, I'm that name sounds so familiar to me, and I'm I'm just completely blanking on what that content looks like. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So she's probably she's she says she's into quantum. So uh, that's I mean mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting topic. Um, For sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, um, our audience is very quiet, so I'm not getting any other questions. I think we can end it here. Uh, if nobody has any questions mm. I'm out of questions so once again thank you very much uh, Dylan mm -hmm. for being with us and let's see if any other last minute okay face says he deals with the power and creates uh, what manifests okay all right cool. so thank you Faith, for cool. sharing and thanks everybody who joined today and Dylan, once again, this was awesome, and I hope you, you can join us again some other time, and we surely want you to, you know, become part of the IT community and, and do this again, you know, more often, you know, some, some other time. That would be wonderful. Um, and yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, so I think... Um, uh, We'll end it here. So everybody, once again, we'll see you on our next next um, webinar. And until then, stay safe and have a great uh, rest of the day or evening. And Dylan, do you have any anything else that you want to talk about, or you know, anything else you have? No, no I mean at this point, I, I think we've got it all covered. This is this has been great. All right. So thanks a lot, everybody, and have a great uh, rest of the day. Bye-bye.